And if they don't see it, they just won't know that we look like brother and sister. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's, that's the only thing they won't know. <laughs> All right, so Grace, you're unmuted, and please go ahead and introduce today's speaker. Keeter, if you turn your camera off, I think we're about ready. Hello, I'm Grace Landon, and I'm a member of the Events Committee of the League of Women Voters. We are here for the May 2021 Hot Topics meeting. And today we have Peter Landon via Zoom to talk to us about the ever more pressing needs of affordable housing in America and in Palm Beach County. Peter has based his career on the needs of affordable housing with his frontline work in Chicago. He started by winning the Young Architect of the Year Award in his late 20s and then continued to become the winner, winner of the 2018 Lifetime Achievement Award in Architecture at a huge ceremony in Chicago. Peter started his firm, Landon Bone Baker Architect, in his late 20s after his one award with the belief that architects are essential community members and he has become a community activist in affordable housing. Peter and his firm, um, sorry, Peter and his firm have won large number of awards for both specific buildings and for how he examines the workers, families, schools, and businesses in the neighborhoods where those buildings have been built and where they will be built. Peter started the architectures program to add local artwork to, and local pride into the new buildings, building better communities for people and families. Peter started to teach in the University of Chicago's Graduate School of Architecture, working with the students to become strong advocates for diverse residents who will be living in the housing they help design. And with that, I will turn this meeting over to my brother, Peter Landon. Thank you, Gail. I mean, Grace, uh, I appreciate that. So um, welcome everybody here. and. I thought what I do today is I'm going to talk a little bit about affordable housing. It's a pretty big subject and I've been involved in it since, um, well, for about 40 plus years now. And, and it gets, it's one of those things that you don't, you don't ever get to the end of it. It keeps evolving it keeps learning and it's a fascinating subject. So <clears throat> I'm going to jump into this. I'm going to share my screen. And because I'm an architect and I do things visually. So um, here's my screen. Start slides from the beginning. Okay, can we see it? Everybody can see it? Okay, I'll assume that's a yes. So um, <clears throat> our firm is Landon Bone Baker. Uh, we've been around for about 33 years, 34 now. Um, <clears throat> and we have a motto it's called Good Design is for Everyone. So uh, I went to, I grew up in the north side of Chicago or in a suburb on the north side of Chicago. And I didn't know, I thought I knew stuff. I didn't know much because I thought that the world that I lived was kind of the world that other people lived in, except for what I saw in National Geographic maybe. And, um, and it wasn't until I went to college and got away from the suburbs and went to school at Can I went to Kansas University and I took a planning course where uh, a kind of cool African American guy took us into the inner city of Kansas City, which isn't big, but it's still it's got all the same issues that everyone has. And I realized that wow, there's a really big world out there. And it was really fascinating and it it became something that right off the bat, uh, I wanted to get involved in. So um, I worked around for a little while. I worked for uh, uh, Harry Weiss Associates and then Ben Weiss. Um, well, okay, and um, for 10 years before starting my firm, what I did when I was working for Ben Weiss, they really gave me entree into community development. So that's what we've been doing, community development, I later left that firm, started Lane and Bone Baker, and we've really been focused on community-based housing ever since. So I'm gonna talk about that. This map here 
All those little red dots, if you can see them all over the city of Chicago are where we've done work. So quite a bit of work. I'm gonna focus on this oval here, which is an area of gentrification in Chicago that we've been focused on just because our clients that we've had are focused on that. So um, uh, what I wanna start out with first though, is just to talk a little bit, go through a little bit of data and then I'll get into the pictures. Um, and just to talk a little bit about affordable housing and what it is and what the issues are that we address. So just um, on this, this slide here, it's by convention, housing is considered affordable to a household with the rent, including utilities is no more than 30% of its pre-tax income. Um, and we'll go through some of those numbers in a minute. And the way a house or an apartment can be made affordable is affordable rents are achieved through one or more subsidies such as federal or state vouchers, loans, zoning relief, which is density, tax benefits, et cetera, that are allocated to the resident, to the developer, or to an investor. So that's what makes units affordable. It's essentially the way it's financed and the way the rent is paid. And then just some statistics about affordable housing that are amazing, I think, is there, there's absolutely affordable housing crisis in this country. Um, there's not a single county in the United States that can fill 100% of its low income population need for safe, affordable housing, which is amazing. Um, there are 46 million people in this country who live in poverty um, and 15 million children or 21% of all children live in families with incomes below the federal poverty level which is, you know, if you don't live in that, you don't even know it because the, the, a lot of the folks that live in that poverty don't really leave because they don't have access to be able to leave. So maybe if you're not there, you don't see it, but it's there. Poor housing and poor health are tied together, which is a huge issue. Um, in the US, renters need to earn an average wage of uh, $20.30 per hour in order to afford a modest two-bedroom apartment. And when we're got, you know, minimum wage averages of 27, 25 an hour, it just doesn't work. Even $15 an hour, which is being pushed, doesn't really work either. So it's, it's a tough situation. Um, there are only 20, 28 adequate and affordable housing options for every 100 extremely low income households. So the statistics are pretty dire. Um, and that we have a lot of work to do. We have to continue to keep uh, doing what we can for affordable housing for everyone, really. Um, so just a little bit more data here. Um, the median annual income of the population uh, age 65 and older is 27,398. That's the median annual income in this country. And that's as of 2019, it might be up a little bit more, but it might be down, I don't really know. So if you look at this chart, this is Chicago area median income limits, that puts you at 40% of the 100% of medium that, that where, where you actually get to the medium. So, so elderly folks on average are pretty low down in terms of the amount of income that they have. And just to look at this in the context of West Palm Beach, it's really essentially the same. I mean, that the one, Sorry, the, the, the one in the Chicago area, 40% is 26, 50% is 32. In West Palm Beach, it's 50% is 30, which is actually a little bit lower. And 30% um, is down at 18. So the 27 number is somewhere about in the 40% number, which is kind of amazing. Um, down at the bottom, just to put that in context a little bit, below 80% is considered low income. So a lot of people that don't even think of themselves as being low income technically are. Um, so $49,000, which is 80% in this chart, uh, times 30% equals $1,230 a month for rent and utilities. And I don't know what you all that are renters pay or even your mortgage, what you pay, but 1230 these days is not a huge amount. But if you look at the median income for 65 and older of 27,000 times 30% is $684 a month for rent and utilities. And you know that's not easy to find that, to be able to find that kind of 
of rent for a lot of folks. I mean, if you have some money, it's one thing. If you don't really have that money, it's you're challenged. And so this is um, just, a, a, I found this um, uh, chart that's really kind of interesting. Um, so low income, which is down at, you know, 20, 30%, there's a deficit of, in this country, of 6.8 million housing units. I mean, there, there's that many that are needed to be able to address that population. Once you get up to about 50%, there's still a deficit of 0.3 million, 300,000, which is still a lot. And when you get into the 50 to 80% AMI, um, area median income, uh, there is there is some housing there. There's 5.6 million, but still the average is down below the zero number. That that high 5.6 is really because a lot of the affordable housing programs that build housing and then can deal with the financing, they can get it down to it really addresses that group more and better than it addresses the lower income group. Um, so. Um, and I'll show you some of those projects. Uh, and then when you get higher than that, it drops off. There's less and less housing available for folks. So um, it's it's kind of a stark reality that we have. Um, I'm going to talk about Chicago mostly because that's what I know. And I haven't worked in Palm Beach other than to help Grace fix up her kitchen. Um, but uh, so this is just to, to show what how things have changed. And this is Chicago, but it's really not different in really any um, any city, even small cities. I think it's probably not significantly different even in Palm Beach County. Um, so uh, if you look at the, the map on the left, um, 1970, all the gray is really the middle income, 75 to 125% of median family income. And then the sort of the beige and the reds and all that are the low income and the high income in 1970, where maybe there was a lot of white flight or there just wasn't a lot of high income in the cities or there or mostly everything was middle class. The green along the lakefront in this case was the higher income. And then in 2012, you can see how it's changed. And this is what's typical throughout the country. The high income stuff has has increased quite a bit, but the low income has increased even more. So if you look at all the red and the beige, um, how much of that there is and, and how much the middle class has really gone away. So what's happened is the middle class has either gone to the low side or the high side. And there's quite a bit of money in cities, but there's also quite a bit of poverty. And that's what this shows. And it's really typical everywhere. Um, so what uh, my firm, or our firm has done over the years is we've really focused on gentrification and, and the resulting uh, movement of, of folks as a result of that gentrification. So in Chicago, going kind of northwest along the river and just the pattern going north, um, diagonally there's this street, Milwaukee Boulevard, that that basically the gentrification has really followed that path north um, in the 30 plus years that we've been working. It started down in the bottom, it says river, river west, river north, river west, right down in here. Um, and up to this area up here up north, which is where we're working now. But what happens is as gentrification happens and people go and they buy an old house and fix it up and it's nice and all that is that they generally there's probably somebody living there when they buy it they kick them out because they're going to fix up the building and where those people go well there's no place to go so they get pushed out away so they end up going in the case of chicago they go west and south into areas that are less desirable and so they not only do they get ousted and kicked out of their neighborhood and their community but they go into where there's housing stock that's less um, good so just to think a little bit, so they need affordable housing. So um, just a thing about affordable housing, I think a lot of people really, when they think of affordable housing, this is kind of what they look at, these projects. This is Robert Taylor Homes, which is an infamous 
Chicago housing development um, on the south side, but it's really not actually that far from the loop, which you can see there at the top of the photo. Um, uh, but when this is gone now, it's been torn down is what they call the plan for transformation. But um, uh, when you were in there, you felt like you were in some other world. You were not even, you weren't anywhere but there. And it was like, if you didn't belong there, and even if you did belong there, it was kind of a scary place. And it got scary because uh, programs were trying to help the, the poor people that tended to live here. When they first did it, they had a program called ADC, Aid for Dependent Children. And if dad was gone, that you could qualify for some additional aid to help support the family. So what happened is dad left and then the family get more money. So ADC came into effect and it essentially wiped out this whole development. And all the men ended up leaving and I don't even know where they went, but you know, they ended up with, uh, you know, in gangs and other kind of situations and on the street and the women stayed home and brought up the children. It's not that they didn't have children, that still happened, but Anyway, that's kind of what people think of it, of affordable or subsidized or low-income housing. And really, a lot of this is gone. And what happened is that in 1966, this woman in Chicago um, uh, filed a class action lawsuit against the city and the Chicago Housing Authority um, to provide scattered site housing for public housing residents um, in areas that were not where concentrations of poverty were. So a lot of the public housing was in the lower income neighborhoods. And this this uh, lawsuit really changed that. And in about 76, I think um, it was um, uh, that this con consent, consent decree came out um, saying that you had to build public housing scattered site throughout the city and not just in the low income neighborhoods. So a lot of the work that I've done really was um, uh, initially we started doing scattered site housing. This is an area directly west of where um, our office was, kind of the near north but west side of Chicago around what's Humboldt Park, which is a really beautiful park. But it was a tough neighborhood there. And these yellow and, and orange and all that, these were scattered site housing that we did that was funded through HUD um, and um, they made these low interest loans um, and, uh, and in order to be able to do the scattered site housing. So what we did starting in 1980 and through 86, we did uh, like 240 unit developments, then a few more and ended up with a total of 318 units on scattered sites throughout um, West Town Humboldt Park area. The first one we did is on the left and the one on the right. We just rehabbed them all about um, three or four years ago uh, so that they're up to date. So a lot of the same folks actually live in these apartments that did 35 years ago. And what that shows to me is that getting out of poverty or getting out of the low income class in this country is very difficult. So if you're not educated, if you don't have any kind of family wealth, if you don't have any of that stuff, it's really hard to change from being poor to being not poor. So um, we kept nice buildings and the buildings were kept up. The Bickard Eggs, the neighborhood based not for profit, they both were the developer and the manager. And we still work with them from the beginning of our office. Uh, so just back to this idea of the gentrification happening as we move north and this oval here, it really pushes people out to these areas on the west side that have been long time neglected. And so there's gangs, disinvestment, and even though there's a lot of density, you can see through the red here, there's still a lot of, um, it's, it's tough areas. So the gentrification is nice but it pushes these people out. And this area between this gap is where we've done a lot of work because the folks that get pushed out of the gentrification areas first end up in this gap because they don't really want to go deep into the west side where it might be worse, though there is some redevelopment going there now. Um, 
And so this is an area where we've done a lot of work. Um, these are just some examples of the kinds of housing that we've done in this that particular gap area that I'm talking about. And all these scattered sites are here. It's three different projects that we did. And the way this stuff has been financed for the last um, probably 20 years now is through low income housing tax credits. So there's about $2.30 now per capita that's allocated for tax credits that can be used for affordable housing. And it's distributed through the states, federal dollars, federal tax credits distributed through the states. And there's a competitive process where you apply for these credits and say each one of these developments that generally are about 70 to 100 units. So this one was 72 and the biggest one was 94 in this group. Um, uh, these buildings, they're scattered site buildings. So it might have 12, 12 or 14 buildings in each group. Um, and what you do is you can apply for tax credits and you might apply for 5 million say um, and uh, and then you can get the allocation of those credits and then you sell them on the market for maybe 90 cents on the dollar or 84 cents on the dollar whatever the going rate is and that money that you get out of that can be used for equity as a down payment essentially on this development deal that you do and then the way the the, the rest of the financing because these deals cost somewhere in the range of 20, $25 million um, to do them all, that, um, that it's layered financing. One layer is the low-income housing tax credits I just mentioned. Then there might be uh, a loan or, or some uh, subsidy from CHA. There might be part of it is CHA residents. And so they would get a voucher, which would, they would pay 30% of their income and the CHA would make up the difference between that and um, the rent that would be set for the building based on the, um, the, the costs of operating these developments. And then there's um, TIF, which is tax increment financing. It's a vehicle for getting some money. There's private loans, there's money that developers get, it's fee-based. They don't make profit per se, they get a fee for doing it. And sometimes they have to um, roll half of their fee back in these deals. They're financed for two 15 year increments. And after 30 years, the developer might get to own these buildings and then they can sell, they could make a windfall profit after 30 years, but you gotta be able to hang in there for 30 years. Um, so. These are the buildings on the left, the upper left are just brick, three flats. Um, we did some uh, some larger buildings that we tried to make them affordable by having all the windows the same and they turned out really nice actually. And then we did on the right is um, uh, precast buildings. So we've been doing a lot of precast construction lately where you do about eight inch thick precast wall panels that um, our idea was to have the, the kind of red or orange um, dividing panels be precast. So we divide up the building that way and then we infill with wood on the front, the green and gray um, wood uh, was gonna be infilled. Then we found out it was cheaper to actually build that out of concrete too. So we used a form liner that created the, what looks like siding and and then painted it. So you paint it with a penetrating stain type paint. Then we landscape them and, and make them nice. And I, I think they end up being really nice apartments. They work well on the street. They work as groups like this and they work as, as either three flats, like would be that much or a six flat, um, which would be that um, in, in the regular blocks where we're infilling. Um, so a lot of there's, I'm just going to show a few examples of affordable housing. So all that stuff is affordable housing because through other ways of finance, the rents can be lower or they can they can use people that they can pay 30% of their income and live in those buildings. Um, there's uh, We've rehabbed a lot of stuff. We've rehabbed high rises, low rise, lots of stuff. This is a historic building. It was what was considered a flop house. And I mean, it was a mess, it had signs all over it from right here, you know, TV in every room, stuff like that. But in fact, it was a beautiful building, it's all terracotta. 
And what we ended up doing is we, we rehabbed the building and this became an SRO and uh, one floor was all women that were previously incarcerated. You get out of jail and it's a tough world out there because who knows, you know, it's gonna be hard to get a job because people don't really want to hire um, people that have been incarcerated and it's tough for them to get the job. So we had one, one uh, floor was women and the other four floors were men. Um, and, uh, and then we had like a garden, a chicken coop, we had a little farm stand in it. There was because of the, the um, farming and the, the community garden that was there, there was a lot of food that came in. There's a training kitchen, teaches people how to cook. Uh, healthy food. Then there was a little, what called a social enterprise it was a cafe and the cafe was operated by residents in the building. I mean, that kind of thing, I think helps people's identity. They help them feel like they're doing something good for the world and they, they feel good. And eventually they can move on from a place like this. So it's, these are great. Um, here's another one where this guy here, Theaster Gates is you know, he's a local artist that was a potter and he got inspired and he's now a world-class artist that is kind of an amazing guy. He also went to planning school and so he wants to do urban redevelopment stuff as part of his artwork. And uh, you could talk about him for a while, but one of his ideas was there is near where he is working. There was this old, uh, CHA, Chicago Housing Authority, um, townhouse development that was poorly built and it was um, it was empty and vacant. So we, we got that thing from the CHA and they wanted to tear it down. We said, no, we're not gonna tear it down, we'll fix it up. We rehabbed it in the center. We took out a couple of the units and built an arts, oh, this is a rendering. Well, it, it actually looks exactly like this. <laughs> um, did an art center here. Um, and these are the rehabs and and this is what an affordable apartment looks like on the inside so the folks that live here get to um they get to have an art center that has music dance programs for kids and it's really active and it's great so um uh, one of my partners Catherine baker did this project uh so another one another situation that's come up in chicago that in this same area, um, they've uh, done the 606, uh, which is a zip code, or the Bloomingdale Trail, which is an old spur, railroad spur that's elevated, and um, they've turned it into a park, something akin to the High Line. Um, it was financed through the Department of Transportation, so it's really became kind of a raised road, um, uh, though it was a pedestrian and bike road. Uh, and so it's, but it's got a lot of landscape. This is when it was new, it's filled in, it's really wonderful and people love it. It's, it's been great, um, but one of the problems is if you get into a neighborhood um, and this neighborhood shows on this map, this is the, in that same oval that we've been talking about, it's great, right about in the middle of it. You, you do something like this, it becomes good and people flock to the area and they start buying the houses. So the area around it became super gentrified really quickly. And, and then all of a sudden, all the people that were living in there that were not gentrifiers or not higher income folks ended up getting losing their, their apartments. So um, one thing that we've done is, this is a, a aerial view of this of Bloomingdale Trail down the center and some of that like this is one of the ones we did. We've done quite a bit of stuff around here over the years. Um, the group Bickerdike that I was talking about that we originally did work with, some of our stuff was maybe in this area, a little bit farther east. Um, this view is looking east. Uh, um, they really had a vision. They anticipated all this gentrification. So they bought property and we built infill housing, some in this area. And now we're still with Bickerdike and with uh, another group called Lucha, and a third one called um, IFF, we've done these scattered site infill housing um, in here, trying to provide some options for the people that are getting kicked out of their houses due to gentrification. Um, just an example of how we've gone about this. We 
um, some friends of our mine, my wife and I, um, and Sabrina had bought this house and it was kind of run down and we worked with them to fix it up for, we spent about 60 grand, not very much, but fix it up, but made it cute. And they liked it. A lot of people liked it in the neighborhood because it was playful and had some nice colors. So they were relatively subdued, but a lot more bright than just the, like one next door, which is more typical. People liked it. So we thought, well, maybe we can use that as an example of, we had started talking to a few developers about doing some scattered site infill housing. So we did, we just took that plan and said, what if we do some small um, accessible so these are wheelchair accessible. So all the, the doors, uh, there's these are two flats. There's a ground floor unit and a second floor unit, but all the ground floor units were accessible so that you could roll your wheelchair right in there. So it was good for people in wheelchair, elderly or whatever. Um, and so we they became playful. And then we, where there were missing teeth or house down, we built these things and it was kind of fun because they fit in, they're a little different, they're, modern and playful. And I think people enjoyed them. They like them a lot. Um, sometimes when we did these, that if the building like on the left here is actually okay, it was kind of a wreck, but we decided rather than tear it down, which is what our client had thought we were gonna do, we said, let's rehab it. So we rehabbed it. And then the context and the neighborhood stays intact, which is really important, I think, um, to be able to keep it intact. And we did some other variations of those ones I showed you before. This is, I think might have been, it's not the one in the photograph that I pointed out, but it's maybe on the other side or a couple blocks away. Uh, and so these are, they're um, buildings that are, they're good, they're sustainable. Um, with this one right here is actually uh, what's called passive house or a six flat and that it's super insulated. Um, we don't have the, PV panels on the roof because we couldn't afford them. But if we did, we could make it a net zero, which means that net zero is that if you build the building right, you have good windows, good insulation, and good mechanical systems, the cost of operating that can be offset 100% with um, renewable energy like, like PV panels on the roof. And if you can offset it completely, the net cost is zero. So we've got it down so that the cost, because of the way they, these are high performance buildings, even though they look kind of like regular buildings, um, they're high performance. So the cost of operating them is really low and that makes them that much more affordable. So actually almost all affordable housing is high performance. Um, whereas market race of isn't necessarily as high performance. The higher end stuff might be, but it's not a requirement. It's a requirement with affordable housing to make it high performance. So this is a typical, this is that same building, typical kind of layout, three bedroom, there's a living room, kitchen, you know, one, two, three bedrooms, uh, bathroom. Uh, here's a three flat, two bedroom, bathroom and two. So this would be on the ground floor, it'd be accessible so you get a larger bathroom. Uh, and this is kind of typical of what the units look like uh, inside um, they're nice, you know, it's a, it's a vinyl strip floor. It's all, it doesn't look that, that much different at all from a market rate unit. And it's really not different. Um, the difference is that it's super well insulated and the costs for utilities are very low here. And the folks that move into these things are thrilled because otherwise they might get booted out of their neighborhood and have to leave and go to the gap or to some other less desirable neighborhood. So these people are happy. We see this all the time and it's great. And they become good neighbors. You know, they take care of their apartments. It's great. Um, so another thing that we do, I'm going to go through this fast. I don't know. I'm not sure my timing now. Does anybody know? Uh, about okay. 15 minutes left. Okay. I'll try to get through this part quickly so we can have some questions if we have it. Um, this is Cabrini Green. This photo right here. And um, a lot of, it's it's really interesting part of that, they have this plan for transformation where they tore down the high rises and they were replaced with mid rise or low rise stuff, 
walk up stuff, mid rise, maybe up to six or seven stories and then some high rise stuff. Um, like market rate housing can be in a high rise, low income housing, the high rises got blamed for it, but it's really, these are kind of nasty buildings, I think. And they mostly, it's not that the building is so ugly though. I think it's not the most beautiful building, but it's just so poorly maintained. And so the whole operation of a lot of this public housing was bad because it was ill-maintained. You know, the elevators are all these stories. The elevators are bad. The kids run up and down the elevators and the, the buildings end up eventually being torn down. And a lot of that replacement is a lot of the work that we've done over the years. This is, again, looking at what was Cabrini Green and this big gap with all the green there. All the high rises were torn down, which there were many and this is just part of it. And it, it's really close in to the city. So this lot was the first one that we did. We did this building here. It's kind of a tinker toy thing. It's precast concrete. It went up really easily. And this is uh, nine stories and it's, um, uh, here's another view, an evening view of that same building. The idea of these buildings, they're, they're financed through uh, tax credits through TIF dollars, tax increment financing, um, through HUD loans, city loans. There's usually like 11 layers of financing to make these things work. And it costs about um, somewhere between 350 and $400,000 a unit to develop it because there's quite a load of soft costs on these developments. The construction cost is about the same as uh, market rate, uh, but you know, it's all union in Chicago, it's all union. Um, there's a lot of minority, local and minority participation. There's all sorts of stuff to make these things, not just be buildings, but jobs as well. So it costs a little bit more to do it, but they end up being good buildings. These guys are good builders. And in this case, and many of these, it's a third, a third, a third, a third subsidized, which is like CHA or a voucher or section eight those are all subsidies that allow you to pay a third of your income and the subsidy pays the balance. A third affordable is up to um, generally below 60% of AMI. Um, and then people pay, they pay the going rents, but um, they pay a third of their income with it. And then a third market rate, which is you just pay the full rent, but because it's in one of these third, a third, buildings, the rents, even though it's market rate is actually a little bit lower. So if you live in a building like this, it's mixed income, but everybody works, you got to work. And, and the buildings are, they're great. I mean, this one, it's been like four or five years now, it looks exactly the same. It's, um, it's kind of what, what these buildings are. So this is a tax credit deal, it's affordable housing, a third, a third, a third. Um, here's another one in this area is at the upper end of that oval that I was talking about, the north end, it's called Logan Square. Um, this little yellow circle over here is where that friend of ours, their house was over there, May and Sabrina, and, that, and, and over off to the lower left is where all that scattered site stuff we were doing, some of it directly to the left, which is west. Um, but we also want to continue to work in that oval in the place that's being gentrified. We want to provide affordable housing as much as we can there. So this is a parking lot. This is right in the thick of the super hipster development stuff right now. So it's changed and gentrified really quickly. Um, it's a beautiful area, this boulevard that goes west and then south is it's beautiful. Um, there are a lot of beautiful houses on the boulevard. The housing is gorgeous. Some of it we've rehabbed courtyard buildings and it's it's affordable, but there's a lot of market rate. And these houses, there's some scattered site affordable, but less and less. So we built this with Bickerdeck again, we did this uh, 100 unit building. So upper right is a sketch of what the building is. It kind of, uh, because the this Emmett Street going up to the, up to the right here, um, there's some you know, regular houses on the north side of the street and we were gonna be on the south side. There are some apartment buildings on the corner. And so what we did is we have 
in our building, we have engaged townhouses. So these are two-story townhouses, each one of these on the bottom two floors of this building. And then we pushed it back so that there'd be green space and a little bit more room so this big building wouldn't be in the face of this people across the street. So what's happened is this area now is actually quite nice. And even in the back, um, it's nice. It's on an alley, but it's nice because there's room for these people. Then there's some amenity spaces and then there's retail storefront. Um, so it's 100, 100 units and it's 100% affordable. So this is actually um, from, the, the, I think the lower end of it is like 30% to 60% or maybe 70% in um, AMI for the residents that can live in this building. The super low income often need other support stuff. So to have the super low in these mixed income buildings doesn't really work because they need other services. And we've done a lot of work for those people too. There are sometimes shelters, sometimes where they have actually a lot of programs and services on site for them. So that's not really for them. This is for people that are, um, you know, at the lowest 30%, but up to uh, about 70% of AMI. Um, a lot of the process of doing these things, we design these buildings, we have community meetings. Uh, and in this case, uh, rather than having a vote, we, everybody had a green card or a red card. And there were about 900 people in this neighborhood. Um, see, there's that same slide we had. Um, there, but um, 900 people in the neighborhood came to this meeting. There's a lot of gentrifiers and a lot of people that have been there or had to leave and want to get back. You know, they'd like to have their their family members live in a subsidized building like that. Some of the elderly folks can live in there. So they came and we had about, out of 900 people, I think there were about 120 that voted no and everyone else voted yes. And the ones that voted no were mostly gentrifiers that, that are there and they want their property values to go up and they don't really care about who was there. They care about themselves. You know, I mean, I understand they care about themselves, but so this is the building we're doing. It's it started. It's precast concrete again. Um, this is just a rendering here. I don't have pictures of it built, but the building is there now, and now they, they do the interior. Um, and this is the way it's set back in this sort of open area with the housing, the houses. There's the just the the entry of it, which is um, you know we. We try to have color on, when we do the buildings, we bring color in, you know, color's nice. And particularly in a place like Chicago, because you get the winters are gray and have this color is pretty great. And then we bring in, um, we try to get public art and to, to bring in a group of Chicago public art group, do murals, glass mosaic tiles on the columns. And, you know, we haven't figured out exactly what we're gonna do for this yet, um, but, uh, over the summer, hopefully we'll get something put on this building because it's just going to be get going here soon. And then just a couple of real quick things. Um, I'm working with some, uh, like I grew up in Pilsen, which is a, um, a close in Mexican neighborhood. And there are a lot of artists there and those artists are getting pushed out. Gentrification is having big time there. So they're trying to work and create these co-ops where they can find people that have been in the neighborhood for a long time. And if they can work out a deal with them, they can sell their building to the co-op. They can live there, live with people that they care about, that they know, and they know, they won't get as much money necessarily, but they get a place that they can call home that they live in. And, um, uh, and other people can live there affordably. So it's happened. We've got a couple of buildings now with this, this one group and it's pretty great. You know, they they are, um, rather than one person making a bunch of money, taking it, leaving, and going, say, to an elderly high-rise and being by themselves, they get to stay in the community. So that's the idea of this. So we're working, and a lot of this is pro bono work, but it's, it's really great and worthwhile. Um, so the folks that do this are... They're great. So it's it's fun to work with them and try to help allow them to to have the life that 
they've built up over the years with their families and not have to be pushed out. And we've done finally um, in South Chicago, the southeast side down just north of the what was all the uh, steel mills, which is a pretty depressed area now. Um, a lot of the kids that live in there and other people leave because there's nothing happening. So this is an idea to build a maker space, this maker space here, and then some tiny homes that are built. Some are a little bit bigger than others. So you could have a small family. Um, there could be teenagers maybe, or young, maybe not teenagers, but young people that could live in these. Yeah, there's a shared kitchen and dining area that this group can share, live in. There's another building here that maybe these food trucks can come and they can do some cooking in here. And then there's this big maker space and it makes it, it's an alternative. The idea is an alternative for people to live and it's all financed through their way of vehicles to use the same kind of financing strategies to be able to build these. We haven't done it yet though. And then finally, we've been working uh, for a number of years on uh, with a group called the National Public Housing Museum. We're about to, um, I think we're gonna break ground later this year, which is great. Their fundraising has been going well. And it's a museum that's really gonna address um, the people and the situation and the communities of uh, uh, public housing and affordable housing uh, um, throughout the country. And um, the people that are involved in this that are great. It's a, it's a wonderful group of people. Um, they're really sharp. There's a lot of community interest that, that um, there's a lot of memory as public housing when it first started was an alternative for people that were maybe young families and just getting going. And it, it ended up getting this bad name, but that's being turned around. And so there's a lot of passion, a lot of memory and all that is going to be um, uh, housed in this museum. So we're pretty excited about this. Uh, and then back to the beginning, good design is for everyone. So we do everything we can to make it as, be as good as it can for everyone. I mean, poor people deserve good design and modern design as much as wealthy people do. And they appreciate it and, and they keep it up best they can. So it's it's something that is it's always good for us to do. So thank you very much. Uh, I think I'll unshare and then maybe I don't know if there's time we can talk a little bit. Uh, there's some questions. Yeah, thank you there, Peter. A uh, couple of questions in here. First is from Andrew. What steps should the city take to be able to encourage this kind of development? You know, there, there are a lot of programs out there. I mean, there's a need, the need is there. I mean, that stuff that I talked about at the beginning, I mean, there's no question there's a need. And I think that what is one of the things that happens is that people don't want that, that NIMBY problem of not in my backyard. So people don't want to have the, whatever, whatever this housing is, they assume it's bad. They don't want that near them they say i'm all for affordable housing just not near me and but in fact the kind of diversity whether it's economic diversity or social or, or you know racial diversity it that kind of thing really makes communities richer and and i think that if people can allow themselves to to you know welcome different kinds of people into the community it can be good so there's property that comes up all the time, whether it's rehab or a possibility for new housing. Um, if you attract, you can attract developers doing RFPs or just reach out because people are there that want to do this. The financing is there. It's it's difficult to do, but it's worth doing. I'm sure there are affordable housing developers in your area. I mean, the one, you know, one of the main ones that we work is they work nationally. They started out in Chicago, but they work nationally now. They're all over the country. Um, and, you know, it takes a while because you have to go through the planning process, you have to figure out the financing, then you have to do the buildings, you got to meet with the community. And, um, but it's doable. You just, you just start. You talk, is there a, I don't know if there's a local housing authority. There, there's got to be some. Um, somebody's been putting out those charts that I found on the AMI so that it's there. 
And I think that, that there are a lot of community groups, there might be CDCs in the area, Community Development Corporation, and they can be a funder. Um, a lot of times private developers partner with a not-for-profit CDC and do a project together. These tax credit deals are can be rehab, scattered site, larger buildings, and they're generally like 70 to 100 units. It's competitive, it's not easy to do, but it's worthwhile and that you know you kind of you can address the need. So that's one way. Rehab is another way. Um, doing scattered site smaller stuff that I showed you some of this stuff, that's hard, you know, because it, it's expensive. Um, because to do multiples of that, it just it takes a big organization to do it. So it's tougher, it's a little bit easier to do buildings that are on one lot or adjacent lots or something like some of those scattered site where we had the sites really close together worked. Um, but yeah, I think you just, you find out who's there, where the money is and where the, and talk to the housing authority, talk to the city. I'm sure that they are, they've got, they've got stuff going on that and it can be thick getting through it. There's a lot of hoops to jump through, but you know, like we find that it takes four or five years to get a project done, uh, which is a long time, but um, that's what it is. And so if you want to do, if you want to do this stuff, um, it's tremendously satisfying. It's good for the community, even though people don't always know that it's good for the community. It is good. Like that kind of diversity, economic and social diversity is good. Um, and it makes it safer for everybody. And yeah, just start. That's what you do. Thank you for that. Uh, Daniel wants to know, do these buildings have tenant review boards that help prevent drug use and other illegal activity from degrading the quality of life for the majority of the, of the tenants? Yeah, they do. I mean, the, the management companies are often, um, what we find is the developer ends up managing the building. Um, it used to be in the public housing buildings that that a housing authority and that still does sometimes the housing authority manages it and sometimes if the housing authority uh, it would get the management would get away from them but I think the, the private management which can go bad too but um, if there's good oversight on the management company the management company have, can have oversight and and communicate with the residents like the group Bickerdeck that we've worked with is very community based. So they're in touch with the residents and they talk to them and there's still some problems with people, but um, they, they try to stay on top of it. And the lower income might have some of those issues that you're talking about and they need to have programs that can address it. You can't just say, don't do it. Um, but I think that, uh, yeah, and a lot of these buildings, you know, I mean, it's funny in the in the mixed income stuff we've had uh, in some of the buildings we've had reports of um, these people complain about the lower income folks are messing up the building, blah, blah, blah. And then we we've done we've had uh, now we have we have cameras on these things and they look at the camera and they find it, it's not the low income people. Actually, it's the market rate people that are that are party and, and, and not being as respectful of the neighborhood. A lot of times the low income people, they're very happy to have a nice apartment and they don't want to jeopardize it. It's not, I'm not saying the low income people are good and the higher income people are bad. It's not that. It's just that it's not the low income people that are bad and the, and the modern higher income are good. It's not like that. So you have to, everybody has to be careful and yeah, you have to communicate. You can't just let it go. So communication is huge. And the more active a management company is, the better off the building will be. Thanks. And we have a question from Elaine that I think you started to answer just now, but it deals with there's very little or no money for low income and affordable housing. How can we incentivize local, state, and national housing programs and builders to provide funding for, for what you've been talking about? Um, well, there, there actually is money. Um, it's just that it's not easy to access. And there are programs, it's competitive. And I think that's, that's what I was saying before. It takes a while to get it going. Like, like a lot of times we do 
a development plan and we'll submit it for funding and it doesn't get the funding. And then, but they do say submit again and we do. And, and sometimes it takes two or three submittals. Usually they have submittal um, application times. You can do it a couple times a year. And so it takes a while. So what we have is we have a number of projects going on at once and hopefully they don't all get funded at the same time for us, but, but I, and generally that doesn't happen, but there is, there's funding out there. You just have to go through the process to access it. Um, it's not like it, there's a tremendous amount of funding, but it, the way to do it really is through these subsidies, um, whether it be tax subsidies, um, the section eight, Section eight, their vouchers can be used anywhere. Those are a little tricky because then the management ends up being the, the building owner. It's kind of harder to stay on top of those things, but it can work and it can work really well. I think that if you can talk again to the housing authority, the city, if you want to do get involved with this and, and try to be an activist to make it happen and solicit developers to come to the area and build with it because they're out there and they want to work. They're looking for projects all the time. And if there's a piece of property that's located in a way that people could, that live there can work, you know, you don't want to have it be out on the outskirts of town where they can't work and they can't get to work. Um, you know, you, it, it can be done. There's money there. It just, it just, it's a, it's an arduous process, but it's, but it does work. And if you do it over time, it works well over time. Well, I know we can talk about this for quite some time more, but to be mindful of your time and those of our attendees, I'd like to uh, ask our president of the league here in Palm Beach County, Kathy Gunlack, to come on and, and thank you. Kathy. There I am. Hi. Oh. Hi. There. Hi. Get the light right here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for this very informative information that you gave us today. And we wish we were uh, we were working with you here in Palm Beach County because we could use you here. Okay, well, you know, <laughs> let us know, maybe we can. <laughs> okay, well, thank you again. And I wanna thank all the members that participated. And the other thing is this will go out on our Facebook page. So we'll get a lot more people looking at it and questioning and seeing what we can do here. Okay, great. And yeah, Ken, I'm gonna update this. I, I made a few changes to this, but yeah, anybody's welcome to look at it. I'll send it over as a PowerPoint and as PDF so you can take it apart if you want to and do whatever you want with it. So. Oh, great, thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, it was fun. And oh, by the way, your sister was able to join us. She is on now. <laughs> okay, glad you made it, Grace. And thanks for inviting me. It's nice. Glad to be able to talk about this stuff. And it's true. We could talk about it for days, but there's a little bit of it. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. okay. Thank you. Take care.